Jacques Ellul, French, Lille, January 6, 1912 to May 19, 1994, was a French philosopher, sociologist, lay theologian, and professor who was a noted Christian anarchist. Ellul was a longtime professor of history and the sociology of institutions on the Faculty of Law and Economic Sciences at the University of Bordeaux. A prolific writer, he authored 58 books and more than a thousand articles over his lifetime, many of which discussed propaganda, the impact of technology on society, and the interaction between religion and politics. The dominant theme of his work proved to be the threat to human freedom and religion created by modern technology. Among his most influential books are The Technological Society and Propaganda, The Formation of Men's Attitudes. Considered by many a philosopher, Eliel was by training a sociologist who approached the question of technology and human action from a dialectical viewpoint. His constant concern was the emergence of a technological tyranny over humanity. As a philosopher and theologian, he further explored the religiosity of the technological society. In 2000 the International Jacques Eliel Society was founded by a group of former Eliel students. The society, which includes scholars from a variety of disciplines, is devoted to continuing Eliel's legacy and discussing the contemporary relevance and implications of his work. <laughs> Life and influences Jacques Eliel was born in Bordeaux, France on 6 January 1912 to Marta Mendes Protestant, French Portuguese and Joseph Eliel initially an Orthodox Christian, but then a Voltairean deist by conviction, born in Malta of an Italo-Maltese father and Serb mother. As a teenager he wanted to be a naval officer but his father made him read law. He married Yvette Lensvelt in 1937. Eliel was educated at the universities of Bordeaux and Paris. In World War II, he was a leader in the French Resistance. For his efforts to save Jews he was awarded the title Righteous Among the Nations by Yad Vashem in 2001. He was a layman in the Reformed Church of France and attained a high position within it as part of the National Council. Eliel was best friends with Bernard Charbonneau, who was also a writer from the Aquitaine region and a protagonist of the French personalism movement. They met through the Protestant Student Federation during the academic school year of 1929-1930. Both men acknowledged the great influence one had on each other. By the early 1930s, Eliel's three primary sources of inspiration were Karl Marx, Soren Kierkegaard, and Karl Barth. Eliel was first introduced to the ideas of Karl Marx during an economics lecture course taught by Joseph Benzikar in 1929-30. Eliel studied Marx and became a prolific exegete of his theories. During this same period, he also came across the Christian existentialism of Kierkegaard. According to Eliel, Marx and Kierkegaard were his two greatest influences, and the only two authors of which he read all of their work. Also, he considered Karl Barth, who was a leader of the resistance against the German state church in World War II, the greatest theologian of the 20th century. In addition to these intellectual influences, Eliel also said that his father played a great role in his life and considered him his role model. These ideological influences earned him both devoted followers and vicious enemies. In large measure, and especially in those of his books concerned with theological matters, Eliel restates the viewpoints held by Barth, whose polar dialectic of the Word of God, in which the Gospel both judges and renews the world, shaped Eliel's theological perspective. In Jacques Eliel, a systemic exposition Daryl J. Fosching claimed Eliel believed, "...that which desacralizes a given reality, itself in turn becomes the new sacred reality." In 1932, after what he describes as, "...a very brutal and very sudden conversion," Eliel professed himself a Christian. Eliel believes he was about 17 and spending the summer with some friends in Blankfort, France, while translating Faust alone in the house, Eliel knew without seeing or hearing anything he was in the presence of a something so astounding, so overwhelming, which entered the very center of his being. He jumped on a bike and fled, concluding eventually that he had been in the presence of God. This experience started the conversion process which Eliel said then continued over a period of years thereafter. He was also prominent in the worldwide ecumenical movement, although he later became sharply critical of the movement for what he felt were indiscriminate endorsements of political establishments, primarily of the left. However, he was no friendlier in his assessment of those of the right. He fashioned an explicitly anti-political stance as an alternative to both. Eliel has been credited with coining the phrase, "Think globally, act locally." 
He often said that he was born in Bordeaux by chance, but that it was by choice that he spent almost all his academic career there. On the 19th of May 1994, after a long illness, he died in his house in Pesic, just a mile or two from the University of Bordeaux campus and surrounded by those closest to him. His wife had died a few years prior, on the 16th of April 1991. Topic: Theology. While Eliel is perhaps most noted for his sociological work, especially his discussions of technology, he saw his theological work as an essential aspect of his career, and began publishing theological discussions early, with such books as The Presence of the Kingdom Although a son of the minority French Reformed tradition and thus a spiritual heir of thinkers like John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli, Eliel departed substantially from Reformed doctrinal traditions, but unlike other European Protestant thinkers, utterly rejected the influence of philosophical idealism or Romanticism upon his beliefs about God and human faith. In articulating his theological ideas, he mainly drew upon the corpus of works by the Swiss-German theologian Karl Barth and the critiques of European state Christianity made by Dane Soren Kierkegaard. Thus, some have considered him one of the more ardent expositors of dialectical theology, which was in decline elsewhere in the Western theological scene during Eliel's heyday. Much like Barth, Eliel had no use for either liberal theology to him dominated by Enlightenment notions about the goodness of humanity and thus rendered puerile by its naivete or Orthodox Protestantism e.g., fundamentalism or scholastic Calvinism, both of which to him refused to acknowledge the radical freedom of God and humanity and maintained a roughly un-Catholic view of the Bible, theology, and the churches. One particular theological movement that aroused his ire was death of God theology. Some within this movement held the conviction that the traditional Christian conceptions of God and humanity arise from a primitive consciousness, one that most civilized people have quite overcome. This line of thought affirmed the ethical teachings of Jesus but rejected the idea that he represented anything more than a highly accomplished human being. Eliel attacked this school, and practitioners of it such as Harvey Cox, as out of accord not with Christian doctrinal traditions, but reality itself, namely what he perceived as the irreducible religiosity of the human race, a devotion that has worshipped idols such as rulers, nations, and in more recent times, materialism, scientism, technology and economics. To Eliel, people use such fallen images, or powers, as a substitute for God, and are, in turn, used by them, with no possible appeal to innocence or neutrality, which, although possible theoretically, does not in fact exist. Eliel thus renovates in a non-legalistic manner the traditional Christian understanding of original sin and espouses a thoroughgoing pessimism about human capabilities, a view most sharply evidenced in his The Meaning of the City. Eliel stated that one of the problems with these new theologies was Eliel espouses views on salvation, the sovereignty of God, and ethical action that appear to take a deliberately contrarian stance toward established mainstream opinion. For instance, in the book What I Believe, he declared himself to be a Christian universalist, writing that all people from the beginning of time are saved by God in Jesus Christ, that they have all been recipients of his grace no matter what they have done. Eliel formulated this stance not from any liberal or humanistic sympathies, but in the main from an extremely high view of God's transcendence, that God is totally free to do what God pleases. Any attempts to modify that freedom from merely human standards of righteousness and justice amount to sin, to putting oneself in God's place, which is precisely what Adam and Eve sought to do in the creation myths in Genesis. This highly unusual juxtaposition of original sin and universal salvation has repelled liberal and conservative critics and commentators alike, who charge that such views amount to antinomianism, denying that God's laws are binding upon human beings. In most of his theologically oriented writings, Eliel effectively dismisses those charges as stemming from a radical confusion between religions as human phenomena and the unique claims of the Christian faith, which are not predicated upon human achievement or moral integrity whatsoever. Topic. On technique The Eliolian concept of technique is briefly defined within the Notes to Reader section of the Technological Society 1964. It is the totality of methods rationally arrived at and having absolute efficiency for a given stage of development in every field of human activity. He states here as well that the term technique is not solely machines, technology, or a procedure used to attain an end. 
What many consider to be Eliel's most important work, The Technological Society 1964, was originally published in French as La Technique, l'enjeu du siècle literally, the stake of the century. In it, Eliel set forth seven characteristics of modern technology that make efficiency a necessity, rationality, artificiality, automatism of technical choice, self-augmentation, monism, universalism, and autonomy. The rationality of technique enforces logical and mechanical organization through division of labor, the setting of production standards, etc. And it creates an artificial system which "...eliminates or subordinates the natural world." Regarding technology, instead of it being subservient to humanity, "...human beings have to adapt to it, and accept total change." As an example, Eliel offered the diminished value of the humanities to a technological society. As people begin to question the value of learning ancient languages and history, they question those things which, on the surface, do little to advance their financial and technical state. According to Eliel, this misplaced emphasis is one of the problems with modern education, as it produces a situation in which immense stress is placed on information in our schools. The focus in those schools is to prepare young people to enter the world of information, to be able to work with computers but knowing only their reasoning, their language, their combinations, and the connections between them. This movement is invading the whole intellectual domain and also that of conscience. Eliel's commitment to scrutinize technological development is expressed as such. The sacred then, as classically defined, is the object of both hope and fear, both fascination and dread. Once, nature was the all-encompassing environment and power upon which human beings were dependent in life and death, and so was experienced as sacred. The Reformation desacralized the Church in the name of the Bible, and the Bible became the sacred book. But since then, scientism through Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and reason higher criticism and liberal theology have desacralized the scriptures, and the sciences, particularly those applied sciences that are amenable to the aims of collective economic production be it capitalist, socialist, or communist, have been elevated to the position of sacred in Western culture. Today, he argues, the technological society is generally held sacred cf. St. Steve Jobs. Since he defines technique as the totality of methods rationally arrived at, and having absolute efficiency for a given stage of development in every field of human activity." It is clear that his sociological analysis focuses not on the society of machines as such, but on the society of "...efficient techniques." It is useless, he argues, to think that a distinction can be made between technique and its use, for techniques have specific social and psychological consequences independent of human desires. There can be no room for moral considerations in their use. Topic. On anarchy and violence Eliel identified himself as a Christian anarchist. Eliel explained his view in this way, "...by anarchy I mean first an absolute rejection of violence," and Jesus was not only a socialist but an anarchist, and I want to stress here that I regard anarchism as the fullest and most serious form of socialism." For him, this meant that nation-states, as the primary sources of violence in the modern era, should neither be praised nor feared, but continually questioned and challenged. For Eliel, human government is largely irrelevant in that the revelation of God contained in Scripture is sufficient and exclusive. That is, being a Christian means pledging absolute allegiance to Christ, which makes other laws redundant at best or counter to the revelation of God at worst. Despite the initial attraction of some evangelicals to his thinking because of his high view of biblical texts i.e., generally eschewing the historical critical method, this position alienated some conservative Protestants. Later, he would attract a following among adherents of more ethically compatible traditions such as the Anabaptists and the House Church movement. Similar political ideas to Eliel's appear in the writings of a corresponding friend of his, the American William Stringfellow, and longtime admirer Bernard Eller, author of Christian Anarchy. Eliel identified the state and political power as the beast in the Book of Revelation. Jacques Eliel discusses anarchy on a few pages in The Ethics of Freedom and in more detail within his later work, Anarchy and Christianity. Although he does admit that anarchy does not seem to be a direct expression of Christian freedom, he concludes that the absolute power he sees within the current as of 1991 nation state can only be responded to with an absolute negative position i.e. anarchy. 
He states that his intention is not to establish an anarchist society or the total destruction of the state. His initial point in anarchy and Christianity is that he is led toward anarchy by his commitment to an absolute rejection of violence. However, Eliel does not entertain the idea that all Christians in all places and all times will refrain from violence. Rather, he insisted that violence could not be reconciled with the God of love, and thus, true freedom. A Christian that chooses the path of violence must admit that he or she is abandoning the path of freedom and committing to the way of necessity. During the Spanish Civil War, Spanish anarchist friends of Eliel's soon to be wife came to France in search of weapons. He tried to get some for them through an old school friend of his and claimed that this was probably the one time in his life when he was sufficiently motivated to commit an act of violence. He did not go with the anarchists primarily because he had only recently met the woman that would become his wife and did not wish to leave her. Eliel states in the subversion of Christianity that he thinks that the biblical teaching is clear. It always contests political power. It incites to counterpower, to positive criticism, to an irreducible dialogue like that between king and prophet in Israel, to antistatism, to a decentralizing of the relation, to an extreme relativizing of everything political, to an anti-ideology, to a questioning of all that claims either power or dominion, in other words, of all things political, and finally, if we may use a modern term, to a kind of anarchism so long as we do not relate the term to the anarchist teaching of the 19th century, Eliel states in violence that idealism serves to justify the use of violence, including, revolutionary idealism viewing violence as a means to an end and or violence under the mask of legality generous idealism leading to violence toward reconciliation and or a blindness of the violence of one's enemy 3. Pacifist idealism beliefs and lifestyles which are only possible within a larger violence-based society 4. Christian idealism which is always concerned with the moral goodness of the human world. This leads to concepts of progressiveness and unreserved participation with good conscience in political or scientific action. In their idyllic world, harshness, torture, and war seem abnormal and almost incomprehensible. But it is only gross, highly visible, undeniable violence that evokes this scandalized reaction. They deny the existence of masked, secret, covert violence, insofar as this can be concealed. Topic on justice Eliel believed that social justice and true freedom were incompatible. He rejected any attempt to reconcile them. He believed that a Christian could choose to join a movement for justice, but in doing so, must admit that this fight for justice is necessarily, and at the same time, a fight against all forms of freedom. While social justice provides a guarantee against the risk of bondage, it simultaneously subjects a life to necessities. Eliel believed that when a Christian decides to act it must be in a way that is specifically Christian. Christians must never identify themselves with this or that political or economic movement. Rather, they must bring to social movements what they alone can provide. Only so can they signalize the kingdom. So far as they act like the others, even to forward social justice, equality, etc. I say that there is no sense and nothing specifically Christian in acting like the others. In fact the political and revolutionary attitude proper to the Christian is radically different than the attitude of others, it is specifically Christian or else it is nothing, in violence Eliel states his belief that only God is able to establish justice and God alone who will institute the kingdom at the end of time. He acknowledges that some have used this as an excuse to do nothing, but also points out how some death of God advocates use this to claim that, we ourselves must undertake to establish social justice. Eliel maintained that without a belief in the traditional Judeo-Christian conception of God, love and the pursuit for justice becomes selective for the only relation left is the horizontal one. Eliel asks how we are to define justice and claims that followers of death of God theology and or philosophy clung to Matthew chapter 25 stating that justice requires them to feed the poor. Eliel says that many European Christians rushed into socialist circles and with this began to accept the movement's tactics of violence, propaganda, etc., mistakenly thinking socialism would assure justice when in fact it only pursues justice for the chosen and or interesting poor whose condition as a victim of capitalism or some other socialist enemy is consistent with the socialist ideology. Eliel states in the subversion of Christianity that to proclaim the class conflict and the classical revolutionary struggle is to stop at the same point as those who defend their goods and organizations. This may be useful socially but it is not at all Christian in spite of the disconcerting efforts of theologies of revolution. 
Revelation demands this renunciation the renunciation of illusions, of historic hopes, of references to our own abilities or numbers or sense of justice. We are to tell people and thus to increase their awareness the offense of the ruling classes is that of trying to blind and deaden the awareness of those whom they dominate. Renounce everything in order to be everything. Trust in no human means, for God will provide we cannot say where, when, or how. Have confidence in His Word and not in a rational program. Enter on a way on which you will gradually find answers but with no guaranteed substance. All this is difficult, much more so than recruiting guerrillas, instigating terrorism, or stirring up the masses. And this is why the gospel is so intolerable, intolerable to myself as I speak, as I say all this to myself and others, intolerable for readers, who can only shrug their shoulders. Topic. On media, propaganda, and information Eliel discusses these topics in detail in his landmark work, Propaganda, the Formation of Men's Attitudes. He viewed the power of the media as another example of technology exerting control over human destiny. As a mechanism of change, the media are almost invariably manipulated by special interests, whether of the market or the state. Also within Propaganda Eliel claims that it is a fact that excessive data do not enlighten the reader or the listener, they drown him. He cannot remember them all, or coordinate them, or understand them, if he does not want to risk losing his mind, he will merely draw a general picture from them. And the more facts supplied, the more simplistic the image. Additionally, people become caught in a web of facts they have been given. They cannot even form a choice or a judgment in other areas or on other subjects. Thus the mechanisms of modern information induce a sort of hypnosis in the individual, who cannot get out of the field that has been laid out for him by the information. It is not true that he can choose freely with regard to what is presented to him as the truth. And because rational propaganda thus creates an irrational situation, it remains, above all, propaganda, that is, an inner control over the individual by a social force, which means that it deprives him of himself. Eliel agreed with Jules Monero who stated that all individual passion leads to the suppression of all critical judgment with regard to the object of that passion. In response to an invitation from Protestant associations, Eliel visited Germany twice 1934 and 1935. On the second visit he attended a Nazi meeting out of curiosity which influenced his later work on propaganda and its ability to unify a group, to throw this wager or secular faith into the boldest possible relief. Eliel places it in dialectical contrast with biblical faith. As a dialectical contrast to la technique, for instance, Eliel writes Sans Fu Ni Lu published in 1975, although written much earlier, topic on humanism in explaining the significance of freedom and the purpose for resisting the enslavement of humans via acculturation or sociological bondage, Eliel rejects the notion that this is due to some supposed supreme importance linked to humanity. He states that modern enslavement expresses how authority, signification, and value are attached to humanity and the beliefs and institutions it creates. This leads to an exaltation of the nation or state, money, technology, art, morality, the party, etc. The work of humanity is glorified and worshipped, while simultaneously enslaving humankind. Topic books Etudes sur l'évolution et la nature juridique du mancipium. Bordeaux, Delmas, 1936. Le fondement théologique du droit. Nucatel, Delachaux and Nicelet, 1946. The Theological Foundation of Law. Trans. Marguerite Wieser. Garden City, New York, Doubleday, 1960. London, SCM, 1961. New York, Seabury, 1969. Présence au monde moderne, Problemes de la civilisation post chrétienne Geneva, Roulette, 1948. Lausanne, Presses Bibliques Universitaires, 1988. The Presence of the Kingdom. Trans. Olive Wyon. Philadelphia, Westminster, 1951. London, SCM, 1951. New York, Seabury, 1967. Colorado Springs, Helmers and Howard, 1989. Presence in the Modern World, A New Translation. Trans. Lisa Richmond. Eugene, Oregon, Cascade, 2016. Le Livre de Jonas. Paris, Cahiers Bibliques de Foy et Vie, 1952. The Judgment of Jonah. Trans. Jeffrey W. Bromiley. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1971. 
WIPF and Stock, 2011 Lum et Largent Nova et Vitera. Nucatel, Delachaux and Nisolet, 1954. Lausanne, Presses Bibliques Universitaires, 1979. Money and Power. Trans. Levon Neff. Downers Grove Ill, Intervarsity Press, 1984. Basingstoke, England, Marshall Pickering, 1986. WIPF and Stock, 2009 La Technique au Lanjou du siècle. Paris, Armand Collin, 1954. Paris, Economica, 1990 and 2008 The Technological Society. Trans. John Wilkinson. New York, Knopf, 1964. London, Jonathan Cape, 1965. Rev. ed., New York, Knopf, Vintage, 1967, with introduction by Robert K. Merton Professor of Sociology, Columbia University. This may be his best-known work, Aldous Huxley brought the French edition to the attention of an English publisher, and thus brought it to English readers. Theodore Kaczynski had a copy in his cabin and said he read it several times, his manifesto addresses similar themes. See Alston Chase, 2003. Harvard and the Unabomber, The Education of an American Terrorist, W. W. Norton & Co., p. 111, 331. Histoire des Institutions. Paris, Presses Universitaires de France, Volumes 1 and 2, L'Antiquité, 1955, Volume 3, Le Moyen Age, 1956, Volume 4, Les Xviex V siècle, 1956, Volume 5, Le Xixe siècle, 1789 to 1914, 1956. Propagandes. Paris, A. Collin, 1962. Paris, Economica, 1990 and 2008 Propaganda, The Formation of Men's Attitudes. Trans. Conrad Kellen and Jean Lerner. New York, Knopf, 1965. New York, Random House, Vintage 1973 Fosse Présence au Monde Moderne. Paris, Les Burgers et Les Mages, 1963. False Presence of the Kingdom. Trans. C. Edward Hopkin. New York, Seabury, 1972. Le Vouloir et le Faire, Recherches ethiques pour les chrétiens, Introduction, Premier Party. Geneva, Labour et Fides, 1964. To Will and to Do, An Ethical Research for Christians. Trans. C. Edward Hopkin. Philadelphia, Pilgrim, 1969. L'Illusion Politique. Paris, Robert Lafont, 1965. Rev. ed., Paris, Library Générale Française, 1977. La Table Ronde, 2004 and 2012. The Political Illusion. Trans. Conrad Kellen. New York, Knopf, 1967. New York, Random House, Vintage, 1972. Exigésie des Nouveaux Lyons Communes. Paris, Calman Lévy, 1966. Paris, La Table Ronde, 1994 and 2004 A Critique of the New Commonplaces. Trans. Helen Weaver. New York, Knopf, 1968. WIPF and Stock, 2012 Politique de Dieu, Politiques de l'homme, Paris, Editions Universitaires, 1966. The Politics of God and the Politics of Man. Trans. Ed. Jeffrey W. Bromiley. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1972. WIPF and Stock, 2012. Histoire de la Propagande. Paris, Presses Universitaires de France, 1967, 1976. Metamorphose du Bourgeois. Paris, Calman Lévy, 1967. Paris, La Table Ronde, 1998 and 2012. Autopsie de la Révolution. Paris, Calman Lévy, 1969. Paris, La Table Ronde, 2008 Autopsy of Revolution. Trans. Patricia Wolfe. New York, Knopf, 1971. WIPF and Stock, 2012. Contra Less Violence. Paris, Centurion, 1972. Violence, Reflections from a Christian Perspective. Trans. Cecilia Gall Kings. New York, Seabury, 1969. London, SCM Press, 1970. London, Mowbrays, 1978. WIPF and Stock, 2012. Sans Fou Ni Lu, Signification Biblique de la Grande Ville, Paris, Gallimard, 1975. The Meaning of the City. Trans. Dennis Party. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1970. Carlisle, Cumbria, England, Paternoster, 1997. L'Impossible Prière. Paris, Centurion, 1971, 1977. Prayer and Modern Man. Trans. C. Edward Hopkin. 
New York, Seabury, 1970, 1973. WIPF and Stock, 2012. Yoines Delinquanti, une expérience en province. Avec Yves Cherrier, Paris, Mercure de France, 1971. Second ed, Yoines Delinquanti, des Blossens Noirs aux Hippies. Nantes, Editions de l'RFP, 1985. De la Révolution aux Revolts. Paris, Calman Lévy, 1972. L'Esperance Oublier. Paris, Gallimard, 1972. Hope in Time of Abandonment. Trans. C. Edward Hopkin. New York, Seabury, 1973. WIPF and Stock, 2012. Ethique de la Liberté, 2 vols. Geneva, Labour et Fides, I, 1973, 2, 1974. The Ethics of Freedom. Trans, and ed. Geoffrey W. Bromiley. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1976. London, Mowbrays, 1976. Les Nouveaux Possédés. Paris, Artheme Fayard, 1973. The New Demons. Trans. C. Edward Hopkin. New York, Seabury, 1975. London, Mowbrays, 1975. L'Apocalypse, Architecture and Movement. Paris, Desclay, 1975. Apocalypse, The Book of Revelation. Trans. George W. Schreiner. New York, Seabury, 1977. Traison de l'Occident, Paris, Calman Lévy, 1975. The Betrayal of the West. Trans. Matthew J. O'Connell. New York, Seabury, 1978. Le Système Technician. Paris, Calman Lévy, 1977. Paris, Le Cherche Midi 2004 and 2012. The Technological System. Trans. Joachim Neugraschel. New York, Continuum, 1980. L'idéologie marxiste chrétienne. Paris, Centurion, 1979. Jesus and Marx, From Gospel to Ideology. Trans. Joyce Main Hanks. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1988. WIPF and Stock, 2012. L'Empire du Non-Sens, L'Art et la Société Technicienne. Paris, Presse Universitaires de France, 1980. La Foy au Prix du Doute, Encore Courant Jour, Paris, Hachette, 1980. Living Faith, Belief and Doubt in a Perilous World. Trans. Peter Hainig. San Francisco, Harper and Row, 1983. WIPF and Stock, 2012. La Parole Humilier. Paris, Sewell, 1981. The Humiliation of the Word. Trans. Joyce Main Hanks. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1985. Changer de Revolution, L'Ineluctable Proletariat. Paris, Sewell, 1982. Les Combats de la Liberté. Tome 3, L'Etique de la Liberté. Geneva, Labour et Fides, 1984. Paris, Centurion, 1984. La Subversion du Christianisme. Paris, Sewell, 1984, 1994. Paris, La Table Ronde, 2001 and 2012 The Subversion of Christianity. Trans. Jeffrey W. Bromiley. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1986. WIPF and Stock, 2011. Conference sur l'Apocalypse de Jean. Nantes, A.R.E.F.P.P.I., 1985. Un chrétien pour Israël. Monaco, Editions du Rocher, 1986. La Genèse aujourd'hui. Avec François Toskels. Ligné, A.R.E.F.P.P.I., 1987. La raison d'être, Méditation sur l'Ecclesiaste. Paris, Sewell, 1987 Reason for Being, a Meditation on Ecclesiastes. Trans. Joyce Main Hanks. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1990. Anarchy et Christianism. Lyon, Atelier de Création Libertaire, 1988. Paris, La Table Ronde, 1998. Anarchy and Christianity. Trans. Jeffrey W. Bromiley. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1991. WIPF and Stock, 2011. Le Bluff Technologic. Paris, Hachette, 1988, 2004 and 2012. The Technological Bluff. Trans. Jeffrey W. Bromiley. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1990. C. E. K. Jacquois. Paris, Grasset and Fascal, 1989. What I Believe. Trans. Jeffrey W. Bromiley. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1989. C. E. Du Injust, Théologie Chrétienne pour le Pupil d'Israël. Paris, Arlia, 1991, 1999. An Unjust God? A Christian Theology of Israel in Light of Romans 9-11. Trans. Anne-Marie Andreessen Hogg. WIPF and Stock, 2012. 
C2S Le Fils de Dieu, Souffrances et Tentations de Jésus. Paris, Centurion, 1991. If You Are the Son of God, The Suffering and Temptations of Jesus. Trans. Anne Marie Andreessen Hogg. WIPF and Stock, 2014. Deviances et Deviance dans notre société intolérante. Toulouse, Ares, 1992. Silences, Poems. Bordeaux, Opals, 1995. Oratorio, Les Quatre Cavaliers de l'Apocalypse. Bordeaux, Opals, 1997. Sources and Trajectories, Eight Early Articles by Jacques Ellul that Set the Stage. Trans, ed. Marva J. Don. Grand Rapids, Eerdmans, 1997. Topic interviews Attempts et a contretemps, Entretiens avec Madeleine Garrigo Lagrange, Paris, Centurion, 1981. In Season, Out of Season, An Introduction to the Thought of Jacques Ellul, Interviews by Madeleine Garrigo Lagrange, Trans. Lonnie K. Niles. San Francisco, Harper and Row, 1982. Perspectives on Our Age, Jacques Ellul Speaks on His Life and Work. Ed. Willem H. Vanderberg. Trans. Joachim Neugraschel. Toronto, CBC, 1981. New York, Seabury, 1981. Concord, Ontario, House of Anansi, 1997. Lama Louis Meme, Correspondence. Avec Didier Norden, Paris, Phelan, 1992. Entretiens avec Jacques Ellul. Patrick Chastenet. Paris, Table Ronde, 1994. Jacques Ellul on Religion, Technology, and Politics, Conversations with Patrick Troud Chastenet. Trans. Joan Mendes France. Atlanta, Scholars Press, 1998. Jacques Ellul on Politics, Technology, and Christianity, Conversations with Patrick Troud Chastenet. Eugene Oregon, WIPF and Stock, 2005. Topic see also Philosophy of Technology Christian Anarchism Christian Libertarianism Universal Reconciliation Nonconformists of the 1930s Propaganda Indoctrination Randall Marlin Langdon Winner Koyaniskotsi Topic References Topic Bibliography Eliel, Jacques 1964, Translator's Introduction, The Technological Society, Vintage Books, John Wilkinson Transel, Random House. 1964b, The Technological Society, Knopf. 1965, Propaganda, The Formation of Men's Attitudes, Knopf. 1969, Violence, Reflections from a Christian Perspective, Seabury, 1975, The New Demons, Seabury Press. 1976, 1973-74, Labor and Fides, Ethique de la Liberté, The Ethics of Freedom, in French, Transel. Jeffrey W. Bromiley, Michigan, William B. Eerdmans. 1981, Perspectives on Our Age, Seabury Press. 1986-1984, Editions du Suil, La Subversion de Christianism, The Subversion of Christianity in French, translated by Geoffrey W. Bromiley, Michigan, William B. Eerdmans, 1988, Atelier de Création Libertaire, Anarchy et Christianism, Anarchy and Christianity, translated by Geoffrey W. Bromiley, Michigan, William B. Eerdmans, pp. 71-74, ISBN 9780802800 4952, 1989, What I Believe, Transel. Jeffrey W. Bromiley, Michigan, William B. Eerdmans. 1991, Anarchy and Christianity, Michigan, William B. Eerdmans. Troud Chastenet, Patrick, 1998, On Religion, Technology, Politics, Conversations, France, Joan Mendes Transel, Scholars Press, Works about Elulboli Bennett, John. The Absolute Dialectics of Jacques Ellul, Research in Philosophy and Technology 3 171-201. Bromiley, Jeffrey W. Barth's Influence on Jacques Ellul, Jacques Ellul, Interpretive Essays 1981, 32-51. Christians, Clifford G., and Van Hook, J. M., E. D. S. Jacques Ellul, Interpretive Essays. Illinois, University of Illinois Press, 1981. Clendenin, Daniel B. Theological Method in Jacques Ellul, 1986, 3756 3756. Connell, Brian Lindsay. 1999. Interpretation of the Law and the Laws of Interpretation in the Work of Jacques Ellul. Global Journal of Classical Theology, 1 3. ISSN 1521 6055. Retrieved 29 July 2017. Don, Marva Janine. The Concept of the Principalities and Powers in the Works of Jacques Ellul, 1993, 0533-0533.
Don, Marva Janine The Biblical Concept of The Principalities and Powers, John Yoder points to Jacques Ellul, The Wisdom of the Cross, Essays in Honor of John Howard Yoder, 168-86. Driscoll, Kathy, and Eldon Wiebe. Technical Spirituality at Work, Jacques Ellul on Workplace Spirituality, Journal of Management Inquiry 16.4 333-348, Eller, Bernard, How Jacques Ellul Reads the Bible, Christian Century 89 1212-1215. Ellul, Jacques, and Madeleine Garrigo Lagrange. In Season, Out of Season, An Introduction to the Thought of Jacques Ellul. Harper San Francisco, 1982. Foshing, Daryl J. The Thought of Jacques Ellul, A Systematic Exposition. Volume 7. New York, Toronto, E. Mellon Press, 1981. Foshing, Daryl J. The Dialectic of Apocalypse and Utopia in the Theological Ethics of Jacques Ellul, Research in Philosophy and Technology 10 1990, 149-165. Fowler, James. A Synopsis and Analysis of the Thought and Writings of Jacques Ellul, 2012. Gill, David W., Jacques Ellul's View of Scripture, Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society 25 Gill, David W., The Word of God in the Ethics of Jacques Ellul, 1984. Goddard, Andrew 2002, Living the Word, Resisting the World, The Life and Thought of Jacques Ellul, Paternoster Press. Ghazi, Jr., Raymond. Jacques Ellul on Technique, Media, and the Spirit, Atlantic Journal of Communication 8.1 2000, 79-90. Graham, George J. Jacques Ellul Prophetic or Apocalyptic Theologian of Technology, The Political Science Reviewer 13 1983, 213. Greenman, Jeffrey P., Reed Mercer Schuckart, and Noah J. Tolley. Understanding Jacques Ellul. WIPF and Stock Publishers, 2012. Holloway, James Y., ed. Introducing Jacques Ellul. Eerdmans, 1970. Hope, Samuel. Homage to Jacques Ellul, Arts Education Policy Review 97.5 38-39. Geronimo, Helena M., and Carl Mitchum. Jacques Ellul and the Technological Society in the 21st Century. Ed. José Luis García. Springer, 2013. Lash, Christopher, 1973. The Social Thought of Jacques Ellul. The World of Nations, Reflections on American History, Politics, and Culture. New York, New York, Knopf. ISBN 978-0-394-48394-8. Retrieved 29 July 2017. Lovkin, David. Jacques Ellul and the Logic of Technology, Man and World 10.3 1977, 251-272. Lovkin, David. Technique, Discourse, and Consciousness, An Introduction to the Philosophy of Jacques Ellul. Lehigh University Press, 1991. Menninger, David C. Jacques Ellul, A Tempered Profile, The Review of Politics 37.2 235-246. Menninger, David C. Marx in the Social Thought of Jacques Ellul, Jacques Ellul, Interpretive Essays 1981, 17-32. Menninger, David. Politics or Technique? A Defense of Jacques Ellul, Polity 14.1 110-127. Mitchum, Carl. Thinking Through Technology, The University of Chicago Press, 1994. Patillo, Matthew. Violence, Anarchy, and Scripture, Jacques Ellul and René Girard, Contagion, Journal of Violence, Mimesis, and Culture 11.1 25-54. Pizza, Cesare, 2017, Jacques Ellul, Un Profeta di Sventure, Roma, ISBN 9788892321663 Punzo, Vincent. Jacques Ellul on the Technical System and the Challenge of Christian Hope, Proceedings of the American Catholic Philosophical Association. Volume 70. 1996. Ray, Ronald R., Jacques Ellul's Innocent Notes on Hermeneutics. Interpretation 33 268-282. Roy, Christian. Ecological Personalism, The Bordeaux School of Bernard Charbonneau and Jacques Ellul, Ethical Perspectives 6.1 33-45.2014 Shaw, Jeffrey M. Illusions of Freedom, Thomas Merton and Jacques Ellul on Technology and the Human Condition. Eugene, Oregon, WIPF and Stock. 
ISBN 978-1625640581. Sclair, Leslie. The Sociology of the Opposition to Science and Technology, with special reference to the work of Jacques Ellul, Comparative Studies in Society and History 13.2 217-235. Sazy, Lawrence J. Hope in the Thought of Jacques Ellul. WIPF and Stock Publishers, 2005. Troop, Calvin L. Include the Iconoclast, The Voice of Jacques Ellul in Contemporary Theory and Criticism, Journal of Communication and Religion 21.1 Vanderberg, Willem H. Technique and Responsibility, Think Globally, Act Locally, According to Jacques Ellul, Technology and Responsibility. Springer Netherlands, 1987. 115-132. Vanderberg, Willem H. The Essential Connection Between the Two Parts of the Work of Jacques Ellul, Bulletin of Science, Technology and Society 24.6 534–547. Van Vleet, Jacob E. Dialectical Theology and Jacques Ellul, An Introductory Exposition. Augsburg Fortress Publishers, 2014. Topic external links Transcript of Eliel's Politics of God and Politics of Man The film The Betrayal by Technology, a 1992 portrait by Rerun Productions, on Jacques Eliel, broadcast twice in the Netherlands on national TV full transcript of the film The Betrayal by Technology by Rerun Productions. Interviewers, Karen van der Molen and Jan van Bokel Jacques Eliel, his activity to save Jews lives during the Holocaust, at Yad Vashem website.